All righty. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Mimota Garcia, and we'd like to officially welcome you and thank you for joining us for this next session of the Ocean Continuum Virtual Series. Uh, the Continuum is an ongoing series of virtual events from speakers and panels on topics that are important to you. Uh, they include cloud networking, healthcare research, and much more. Today, we welcome Dr. Liz Goldberg from Brown University and Samir Halai from WeHealth, as they both discuss their respective COVID-19 application platforms. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to please feel free to use the chat box to ask questions, share your feedback, uh, or any comments to today's group. Additionally, if we could make sure that all of our mics are on mute, that would be great. Um, and just as a reminder, this session will be recorded. Now I'd like to introduce and have Doug Alexander kick us off. Hi everyone, thank you for coming today. My name is Doug Alexander. I am recently joined Ocean as the uh, manager of uh, member services Ad advocacy. And I'm very excited to have our two speakers here today. We, it's hard to describe why we're doing this panel without slipping into some, you know, typical COVID platitudes, right? These are hard times, it's an extraordinary thing, all of the, so insert all boilerplate COVID text here. Um, but the truth is that we all have to think about risk and assess risk, and we're all responsible for keeping ourselves and everyone else healthy. And on a human behavioral level, this is not an easy task. In fact, assessing risk is not an easy task for a lot of people. But we're fortunate enough to have here today a couple of very smart people who have engaged with very smart teams and some very clever solutions to stopping the spread of COVID and helping people assess their risk or their exposure um, in ways that we hope will change folks' behavior and help uh, flatten the curve. There, I used one of the platitudes, flatten the curve. Um, you know, even as we are ending 2020 on a hopeful note with vaccines, we're still in for a long winter and we're still in for you know, other flu seasons, other possible uh, epidemics, hopefully not pandemics, where we need to take another look at how we use technology to change folks' behavior and actually stop the spread of not only COVID, but a number of pathogens in a number of places around the world. So today we have Dr. Elizabeth Goldberg from Brown University, and uh, she will be talking about her My COVID Risk app. Um, and we also have Samir Halai from WeHealth. I'm going to do a couple of brief intros of them, and then we're going to get into uh, each of them presenting their solutions, and then we'll have some questions. So please feel free um, at any point in this to put a question in the chat, and I will make sure that we uh, direct that to the appropriate people um, in the second half of the hour. Uh, Dr. Liz Goldberg is a board-certified practicing emergency physician who works in lifespan um, hospitals, Rhode Island and Miriam, um, and is also a professor with Brown University. Um, if you look at her resume, it pretty much screams, I am front and center in the COVID uh, pandemic because she not only does emergency medicine, she not only has a master's in epidemiology, she's also studied a good deal around gerontology and keeping uh, elderly patients who are high risk safe. All of which is like just, I mean, it's everything intersects around COVID. It was pretty remarkable, Liz, reading your bio, how much of a moment this is for you. And I'm really excited for you that you get to work with the Brown Center for Digital Health because um, it's an amazing set of resources and you're just the perfect person to be uh, centered on this. Um, so like I said, uh, Liz will be talking about her My COVID Risk app, which is an app that she has developed with the, at the Digital Health Center at Brown to help people assess their own risk in various situations for catch for exposure to COVID. Samir Halai, on the other hand, is a, an equally impressive figure with a, a, a resume that is difficult to encapsulate in a single uh, bio. He is the founder and CEO of WeHealth, and he is an entrepreneur who has, as he puts it, a passion for solving wicked hard problems, which is a phrase we can absolutely get behind here in, uh, in New England. Um, Samir has, uh, is a Microsoft alum, but he's worked in so many different industries. And Samir, I'm going to miss one, I'm sorry. But uh, solar, financial, and business analytics, um, and of course, health and wellness, which is where you are right now with WeHealth. And I was particularly fascinated in your, uh, you're the first person to receive a master's in social computing from uh, University of Michigan, which I thought was really, uh, again, who, who better to be in the uh, center of these, these kind of uh, solutions than someone with your uh, credentials. So we're very lucky to have you here. Um, I encourage everyone to go read Samir's blog because it's deeply interesting and goes way beyond uh, just WeHealth. Um, but thank you, thank you both for being here today. I really, uh, really appreciate it. 
So we're going to start with uh, Liz Goldberg, uh, who has some slides and uh, a brief talk on the My COVID Risk app, which you can actually download at or look at at mycovidrisk.app. Um, so Liz, I'm very much looking forward to your presentation and uh, we will save our questions to after, but take it away. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Doug, for the introduction and to Ocean for having me here today. And just checking, you can see my slides all right? Yes. Yes, wonderful. Okay, so as Doug said, I'm an emergency physician. I'm also an associate professor at Brown in emergency medicine and faculty in the Brown Lifespan Center for Digital Health. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Liz Goldberg uh, MD, and please do look me up and feel free to ask questions over that forum too. So why am I here today? So as Doug said, I actually am mainly focused on fall prevention in older adults and um, how to use the Apple Watch to improve health. And um, this idea of getting involved with COVID and helping people understand their risk actually emerged on social media. So my co-creator, Dr. Megan Rennie, and also the director of our center, um, tweeted out this informative diagram about what your individual risk is when you attend activities. And this was in mid-July. We were just starting to understand how COVID-19 is being transmitted. And I responded to her that we really need to find a way to make this information more accessible to the public. Um, because as many of you know, uh, there has um, really been a call to action, not only among governmental officials, but scientists and physicians. And there's really a need during these pandemics to collaborate together. And so both Dr. Rani and myself decided we would pivot to COVID during this crisis. And um, shortly after I, I tweeted this out, she actually called me on the phone and she said, let's make this app happen. We can figure this out together. We have the resources at the center. And the idea was we have so many patients and friends that approach us and say, you know, is it safe to go to Thanksgiving with 10 other people? Is it safe to travel across the country and do this? And you really shouldn't need an emergency medicine doctor friend to be able to figure out your own risk. So between July and when we launched in, in October, we did a lot of work on this app. And I wanna tell you a little bit about our backstory and how this came to be. So as, um, as I said before, in the Brown Lifespan Center for Digital Health, we have not only physicians, but also researchers. We have an app developer, UX designers, and UX research team. So we already had a lot of the elements that we needed to create the app present at the center. Um, our hope was really to merge evidence-based science with digital technologies. And uh, one of the, the great assets we have in this being at Brown is that we um, have a lot of knowledge and expertise in using um, what uh, emerged as the most valid data through systematic reviews and meta-analyses and clinical trials to really put that knowledge into this app and make it accessible for free to people. And we designed this with the idea that we really wanted to include the main things that uh, control transmission. So when we looked um, online and talked to our, our friends, we noted that a lot of the, the apps that give you information on your risk didn't include uh, local disease prevalence. And at that time in July in Rhode Island, we we're seeing something like 50 to 100 cases per our 1 million population. So we had a pretty low risk. If you attended an event of 100 people, the risk was still quite low that someone would be there that has COVID-19, which is a major um, factor in whether you're going to um, get the virus. Um, but maybe if you were living in Texas, where there was a, a major, where there are major outbreaks, uh, outbreaks and a surge, your risk would be much higher. So we knew we wanted to conclude up-to-date prevalence information, and we were able to source this from the New York Times through an API. The other thing that we wanted to include is what was emerging as a really credible way that people were getting this virus, which is aerosol transmission. And so we knew we, we, knew we wanted to include whether the event that the person was planning on attending was outdoors or indoors. And I wanna back up a little bit and talk a little bit about the main ways that we know COVID is transmitted because it's really essential in understanding why this app is useful to people. 
So there are three main ways, and we've really changed our thinking about how COVID is transmitted since the beginning. So first, I want you to look at the cell phone that's being passed between the index case, which is the infected person, and the exposed contact. And this is fomite transmission. That's when you touch a surface that contains the SARS-CoV virus, such as a light switch or a door handle, and then you transfer the virus onto your hands and then uh, into your mouth, nostrils, or eyes through your own hands. We now know that that's actually one of the um, less common ways that this virus is transmitted. And that's why you've also seen people relax um, in terms of when they get their groceries, they're not wiping it off with bleached, um, bleached towels and such anymore. Um, the other way that we know that uh, COVID-19, um, the SARS-CoV virus is transmitted is through large droplets. So if you can see the light blue dots that are um, connecting the index case with the exposed contact, those are large droplets. And they're also called ballistic droplets. And these are respiratory uh, fluid or saliva that are larger than 100 uh, micrometers. And they're expelled from infected individuals when they cough, they sneeze, or even when they talk. And they fly ballistically through the air and they impact on the mouth, nostrils, or eyes. And usually what happens if, they, if, if the ballistic droplets do not contact you in the face, after three to six feet, they drop to the ground because they're larger, they're heavier. So this was how we thought that, that COVID-19 um, outbreaks were occurring. We thought that this was due to fomites and uh, due to droplet um, transmission, large droplet transmission. But then we had the Skagit Choir case, and that was the case of the outbreak where we knew that there were people that were standing more than six feet apart from each other. They weren't sharing fomites, and yet there was a huge outbreak in the, among these choir um, uh, personnel. Um, and what we discovered is that truly there must be aerosol transmission occurring. And what is aerosol transmission? So aerosols are particles of saliva or respiratory fluid that are smaller than 100 micrometers and they can linger in the air. So after the person coughs or sneezes, um, and you can see this in those small red droplets, they can actually stay in the air for up to several hours and they can and they can go much further than uh, one to two meters or three to six feet. Um, and so now, finally, um, the CDC is recognizing that we do have aerosol transmission and that's a very viable way that this, this uh, SARS-CoV virus is getting transmitted. And so we use this science and incorporated it into our app. I also want to show briefly the way um, some other ways that risk has been displayed in the in um, the popular press. So this is from an article in the Washington Post, and it originates from research that Jones et al. did and published in the BMJ. And what the takeaway is of, of uh, this graph is that the risk of SARS-CoV transmission from asymptomatic people in different settings really depends on um, how long you are in a, in a place, how well it's ventilated, and how well it's crowded, um, and things like face covering. So if you can look at the top here, you can see that, um, that people that are wearing face coverings can even be in indoor and outdoor spaces pretty safely if it's a low occupancy setting. But if you move down here lower on the page, you can see that if you're not wearing a face covering, um, whether and you're there for a prolonged period of time, almost every situation is unsafe. And so this is a, another way that we try to communicate risk to people. And then of course the immediate question is, well, how can, how can I protect myself? Now that I know that just standing uh, three to six feet away is not safe enough um, and it, it isn't sufficient indoors to protect myself, how can I protect myself? And so that's when we started talking a lot more, and this was in July, August, September, started talking a lot more about improved ventilation, filtration, and things like portable air cleaners. So you can see here, if this person was standing just uh, one to two meters away, they would be in touch with these respiratory droplets and could potentially get COVID-19. But if you 
um, are, are avoid recirculation of air, instead get fresh air in and infected air out. Um, so there's a dilution effect. If you open windows to increase the amount of times that the air inside the, the room is circulated, and if you use things such as portable air, cleaner, air cleaners with HEPA filters, then you're much less likely to, um, to get uh, COVID-19 in a, in a small space. So how, how did we integrate this into our app? So the individual user, there's two steps to our app. The first is um, having the user put in information about the event that they plan to attend. And they enter things such as activity level, because we know, for instance, if you have COVID-19 and you're in a closed space with someone and you're doing heavy exercise, your emission rate of these particles is much higher because you're breathing faster, your respiratory rate is faster. So that's um, a more dangerous situation than if you're in a room with someone with COVID-19 and that person is sleeping because their, their respiratory rate declines when they, when they, when they sleep and they're less likely to emit the virus. The same thing with breathing rate. If you're, if you're next to someone that's um, uh, loudly uh, speaking, um, you're much more likely to get particles um, near you than if they're only breathing silently. And then duration of stay is another major variable that went into our model. So we know that if you reduce your amount of time that you're in an indoor space, you also reduce risk. And I also want to uh, acknowledge here Prof Professor Jose Jimenez, who has done, who's an aerosol researcher and has from very early on been saying that there's aerosol transmission. And, um, and uh, I want to acknowledge the COVID-19 aerosol transmission estimator, which is also a wonderful calculator that you can access online to, to assess your risk. So then let's say uh, you're told that your event is high risk. And so this is the first output that the user receives. And then one of the things we wanted to do was to show them how they could reduce their risk. So then the user presses um, this button right here to learn more. And then they can input things that reduce risk. And things that reduce risk are wearing a mask. And we know that masks have different efficiency rates. So for instance, if you are wearing a homemade mask, um, a double layered mask that's out of cotton is much more protective than wearing a bandana. So we wanted to give people the option to input that. The same with wearing a surgical mask um, with ties behind the, um, behind the head are, is actually more uh, likely to filter out virus than um, one that only goes behind your ears. And then N95, of course, um, filters out the majority of virus. Um, and then social distancing, the, the more you increase your space away from that person, the more protective that is. So we wanted to give people the option to say, well, I'll move further away from other people to make this event safer. And we also know that fomite transmission still does um, transmit virus. So for instance, if you wash your hands more than five times a day, you're 15% less likely to get COVID-19. And we have research studies that show that with SARS-CoV-2. So um, you get this mitigated risk score. You can also put in eye protection, which we know is protective. And that information was all sourced from articles such as um, the Lancet article that um, reported odds ratios and risk ratios um, of risk mitigation um, with SARS-CoV-2. So I will say the science is still developing uh, on this, but we use the best science available at the time um, to create this app. So then you um, receive an adjusted risk score and hopefully you've lowered your risk. Um, another challenge that we had in creating this app was that everybody has a different appreciation from, of what is risky. And so there are many different ways scientifically that you can approach creating risk scores. The way that we um, approach this is really asking publicly, what do people consider a high risk scenario? And what we settled on in the end after uh, user testing and asking uh, colleagues of ours and also using our own clinical experience with, with people's risk assessment was that a very high risk situation was akin to living with someone that you knew had COVID-19. And we know that within families, within those family clusters, your, your chance of getting the virus is about five to 15%. So we settled on 5% as being the very high risk category. Um, what was very low risk is the akin to getting into a fatal um, accident when you get into your vehicle every day. So it's a lifetime risk. And so if you um, complete, uh, if you put in your user information about the activity you're gonna to go to, say a grocery store or going to the gym, and you get um, very low risk, then 
our hope was to decrease anxiety and, and encourage people to, to engage in those type of activities and to also use mitigation uh, techniques to reduce their risk. So fortunately, we've been very lucky to um, have received uh, a, a lot of press um, on this topic. So the, our app has been um, uh, publicized in CNN, in the Atlantic, in Business Insider, in men's health magazines, and I'll be talking to NBCLX and uh, later today. Um, we've had over 915,000 um, uh, users um, access the app and, and run different scenarios through the app um, since our release at the, at the end of October. And I want to leave you with this um, final picture. This is a picture of Dr. Rennie um, at, at the Miriam Hospital and a picture of, of me in the critical care rooms with my colleagues. And uh, this is one, one quote that um, I want to leave you with. The whole idea behind the app is to empower people to do things more safely. I think one of the worst things about COVID is that it's taken away all of our sense of control. I hope that people would only engage in those very lowest risk activities. So we're so grateful to be here today and thank you for giving um, me the opportunity to talk about the app. And thank you for developing such uh, a remarkable uh, tool to help us, to help us all, to help everybody all over the country um, assess our own, our own risk. That's amazing. I have a million questions for you and I will, I will hold them all. Hopefully our, our participants also have questions that arose out of that. I know as someone with school age kids and as somebody I should have mentioned, you're also on the school board of Providence Public Schools, which is an interesting place to be for all kinds of reasons. Um, we'll, we'll get back to that. But thank you. Thank you for that. That was really, really interesting. Um, and what's interesting, too, is that the two tools that we're talking about today, the, the my COVID risk is about sort of proactively assessing risk and thinking ahead about situations you're going to put yourself in. And then uh, Samir Halai and We Health's uh, my uh, COVID watch, sorry, COVID watch app is a, uh, a lot about, um, I, well, I called it when we initially chatted a Geiger counter for COVID, which you reacted to fairly strongly, um, but it really is about detecting and notifying folks when they have been exposed um, and, and so much more. So I'll let you talk about that, but it's, it's sort of interesting how there are two sides of the coin and, and they're data that we both, we need, you know, that we, all, that we need on both ends. So um, Samir, has an app that he's going to talk about that builds on um, some foundational uh, technology from Google and Apple that I think is fascinating. And um, I know you guys have done a ton of work um, and, and testing and, and all the rest on this app. So um, I'm excited to hear more about it. So take it away, Samir Halai. Um, thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction, Doug, by the way. Uh, and thanks, Elizabeth, for that awesome presentation. It's fascinating to see how much has gone into it and all the focus on design and everything to make it actually be useful for end users, which is the key thing. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. Okay, so um, I'll back up a little bit too. I'm preaching to the core here, but just want to set context on kind of where we are coming from and what we're trying to do. So we know, like the world, we all know now how much the world has changed and kind of where we have uh, found opportunities to do better. Uh, and, and, and this is all like a great learning experience to all of us. So we just kind of want to acknowledge that. Um, and just seeing uh, also uh, just like how, how many trends have come into play that we are now able to see that's are coming together as to, hey, yeah, there's some problems we can solve. Here's some opportunities that we can combine and see how we can uh, bring solutions that can scale us really well. So that's kind of one of the things we think. Uh, so we saw ourselves in this position and we came up with we have the app and I'm gonna talk about the app, but we also wanna call out that we have actually invested in basically, oops, I'm going forward here. Uh, basically a whole platform that we built around it too, because we are really focused a lot on public health uh, and again, public health involved in the whole process. So um, so I do wanna start with uh, a little bit about the timeline here. Uh, so I got involved with this. I, as Doug mentioned, I've been in startups uh, for some while. I was at Microsoft, also in Microsoft Research, where I worked in incubation labs with academics trying to bring new technologies to markets. I've kind of been in that. Uh, and then when COVID happened, I found myself in between things when I was trying to figure out my next thing. So I just had some time and I got sucked into, hey, there's an opportunity here. Uh, so I've been working, uh, one of the kind of founding members of COVID Watch, which is a nonprofit that we started uh, to kind of start to advocate for um, privacy preserving approaches to kind of how we can do contact tracing and how we can kind of 
connect with people and help solve some of the problems we are seeing. Um, we did a lot of uh, lobbying work uh, and advocacy work to get Google and Apple to uh, adopt the protocol that we had developed uh, to kind of uh, to make this kind of uh, uh, anonymous contact tracing work. So sometime in April, Google Apple did the unexpected. Like I didn't know, I, I honestly didn't think they would do it. Uh, but in April, they announced that we are going to change our operating system to make this new protocol work, which was great. Um, but they required public health authorities to be involved in it. You needed to have a state or a country uh, to even start a pilot. Uh, and so we were the first uh, uh, pilot of this technology in the US. Uh, we worked with the state of Arizona to get going to demonstrate that it, it can actually work. Uh, and then um, we helped as the organization that actually then uh, brought this to market uh, and has been kind of working with the states uh, to kind of roll it out and scale it. Uh, so right now we just launched in Bermuda. We've already been in Arizona and now we're scaling up in Arizona. So that's kind of where things are. Um, and so I'll go a little, I talked to her about what, what it is. So I'm just gonna go and actually use Doug's example of uh, the Geiger counter. So thanks for giving us the push to lean into that. So, so last year, actually I was in Chernobyl, which is really fascinating. So when we went in there, so we all know there's radiation there. We all know there are different zones with different levels of risk. Uh, and, and you go in and you have a guide and they tell you, you can walk here, you cannot walk here, you can go here, you shouldn't go here. Don't step on the moss, it's radioactive. But if you walk between the moss, you're fine. And so you have all these things people tell you. And then you also put this thing around your neck uh, and, and, and I have this real time meter of what my radiation is and then a total count of for the day. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, I was able to just see uh, when we came back to my car that what was the total radiation that I was exposed to? Did I actually follow things right? Did I actually keep myself safe? And I was able to see that the amount of radiation I got as I was walking through all the places in Chernobyl was actually no more than a transatlantic flight. So it was basically just flying and that was it. And so that made me realize, all right, I, I was safe. I trust my guide more. Uh, and the other part was that this was not tracking my location. It wasn't tracking any, any of my movements. This was just a personal thing to me that I could just check to see if, if I did right. What was my physical experience of what I did in the day? Uh, so that was very interesting. Uh, and that's kind of basically what we have uh, with this app that we have using Google Apple's technology. So... This is the official documentation of Google Apple. So they talk a little bit about how this works. I don't want to go too much into it because that itself is a really fascinating months of work by hundreds of researchers that went into it. But the basic thing is that when two people have the technology uh, enabled on their phones, which is now on every, every phone, you just have to opt into it. Uh, uh, then your phones start exchanging completely anonymous data between them uh, to kind of just know which phones were you near uh, at certain uh, times and what was the signal strength between them which is a proxy for distance. As Elizabeth was calling out, like you need different distances amount to different risk and things like that. You don't always know, especially on Bluetooth, it's not that accurate as if you're seeing, but it's an approximation. So you kind of know that. Uh, and then all of that uh, goes into just keeping track of which were the phones that I was exposed to in the last 14 days, uh, at what distances and for how long. And then when any one of the people uh, tests positive, they can choose to mark their phones as infected. Uh, and so then, uh, the other phones are able to just find out that, hey, uh, in the last 14 days, I was exposed to this amount of uh, infection. And that's what it just cumulatively says. I don't know who exposed me. I don't know where it was. I'm just able to do some uh, overall determination that because of this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, anonymous exchange of some data, uh, I, was, I, I can just see my cumulative score. So, uh, so that's basically what it does. And privacy is the key thing. To install something on your phone and to trust that you know, technology is like private and it's telling you your, your exposure, but it's not keeping track of location and identities and anything. Uh, the key thing for people to trust that is privacy focus. And that's the main innovation here, that it is truly uh, anonymous. It's truly peer to peer. There is no central system that knows who you are or who gets notified and who's exposed and any of that. This is just like that Geiger counter. I just know for myself, my physical experience and that's it. And I know my radiation, I know my exposure. I can choose to ignore it. No one knows about it. If I did something wrong, then I, I find out, but no one else finds out. But that's basically how this works. Uh, so this gives people some trust and agency into what's going on. Um, what we have done on top of that, the basic underlying thing is we invested a lot in actually kind of, again, as Elizabeth is calling out, the science is still developing. We're still learning how transmission happens. There's the aerosol stuff. There's the fomite transfer and all these things. So we are combining this data that we get from the physical kind of uh, Bluetooth protocol, uh, along with knowledge about the infectiousness of the person, whether symptomatic or not symptomatic, how many days had elapsed, 
10 set exposure. When you are exposed, we know that if you are uh, symptomatic, then there's a four day window when you have the highest transmission risk and then the risk falls off. So based on all of that, we do a lot of the math and we calculate the total uh, dose uh, that you received across all the exposures you had. So if you remember, like the CDC had a different guideline at the beginning that it has to be one, one uh, exposure event was 15 minutes with one person. Now it's cumulative across multiple. So we already had all that because we knew that's where we need to go. So we built the whole thing in a very flexible way because we're learning and we'll keep learning. Uh, and so that way we eventually bring it down to what is the risk that you're infected today based on your exposure history over the last 14 days uh, and what was the amount of infection that you were exposed to or how long at what distances, we just give you uh, a, an overall score. When you hit a certain threshold is when we uh, notify you that, hey, you met a threshold where we think now you might be at a risk of exposing others. Um, and because of all the underlying math uh, that's available, we can also offer dynamic recommendations. So we can say, if you just stay home for five more days, that's gonna reduce your overall risk to the community so that you don't have to, of course we had, again, the standard was 14 days recommendation when you have an exposure. Now it's going down to 10, maybe seven, with some more testing. So all of that we already built into it so we can keep matching up with the latest science and, and make sure that we are focused on, as was introduced at the beginning of this meeting, how do we reduce the overall spread? How do we slow down? Uh, and, and there's a lot of things we can do. We don't have to, Create too much burden of quarantining on everyone if you don't have to. We can stratify who are the people that are the highest risk and, and address them uh, more, more clear, uh, clearly. So that's basically what we are doing over here. Um, and then this is just a visual of seeing that, that we can also set different risk thresholds. So depending on the state of the outbreak, uh, like New York City might be very different from upstate New York. Uh, maybe the same risk thresholds don't make sense for them, depending on the case counts, depending on the ICU uh, capacities, depending on testing availability, uh, we can set different thresholds. So the PHA can decide, the public health can decide, who do we want to put into what risk bucket? Who do we want to do something? Who do we not want to do something? We don't want to lock down the whole state. We might want to just focus on some counties that need a little bit more intervention, some that don't, and kind of play around with this and make this a real time system. So that's why that public health piece is very important and that's what we invested a lot in. So, the other thing it does is, of course, manual contact tracing is very valuable and it's important. This is just one other way that you may not realize you exposed yourself to someone or you came in contact with someone. Uh, and so this is a way to kind of catch a few more people than you might get to contact tracing manually. And also a way to reach them more quickly because you don't always get to uh, get to other contacts uh, quick, quickly enough. That's the other piece here as well. Now, oh, the main question, does it actually work? Like this is all new stuff, right? So, uh, so that was the thing. With, with the pilots that we did, we, we intentionally launched in communities where we could uh, drive high adoption quickly and demonstrate that it works. So universities was a great testing ground for doing that. We're able to see that uh, you know, the app uh, installs went high uh, very quickly as people started to see that they were getting notifications. Everyone else wanted to get in on the action, so to speak. They wanted the app to, I want to know what's going on as well. So that was like very high adoption, just peer to peer. Uh, and then we were also able to see that, um, that on the campus, uh, there was a decrease in the outbreak. Not all credit just to the app, but also just the overall testing regimen and the app being one part of it. But overall, with all the interventions, we did see uh, that, uh, that the spread was uh, reduced on the campus compared to just even the, the adjacent uh, county around where the cases were actually rising. So just released some of this data more recently. There's a little bit more we can go into. Uh, we just got featured in the New York Times recently. We have also been covered by a few other outlets and the New York Times talked about specifically this study. So now we have a little bit more uh, kind of uh, out there because we need that validation to, to demonstrate that it works. But based on that, now we're launching in Arizona because we've been able to demonstrate that it's truly effective at doing what it does. Uh, and in general, you don't have to have the whole uh, state uh, action solid with even incremental adoption, the more people know, the more they understand, the more they respond, it drives behavior change and it starts to show results incrementally. Um, so here's a little bit about uh, the apps themselves. They're live, you can install them, try them out, uh, just kind of going into kind of how we positioned it to the end user, because of course people need to trust it, they need to know what it is. It's an official app coming from the public health departments. It's published by uh, the state of Arizona's health department. So that way you kind of know it's the official app for your state and you, and you trust it and then you still know it's safe and uh, uh, private and, and all that too. So that's kind of the important piece. Um, 
we invested a lot in the design of the app. It has been to lots of iterations. We have a user research team and designers and uh, full support uh, and all that too. We offer full support to anyone in the state who has questions. So we improved that a lot significantly. One of the key things we added as a result was initially we were uh, just saying you have no exposures and then we tell you when you have high exposures, but then we realized that we have an opportunity to do early detection and let people just kind of know, hey, just so you know, based on, and this goes straight into what Elizabeth is talking about. Just so you know, today you had some exposures. Uh, they don't add up to anything significant, but FII, maybe that gas station thing and the grocery store thing, that's how they added up. Right? That, that's some way to kind of just get physical proof. Uh, and it suddenly converts like this idea into something tangible I can connect to a little bit more, that I can see my phone detected these things over the day. Uh, so that's what we are able to achieve here. And so there's a long window of behavior change that we get to before we even expose, uh, send an exposure notification. Um, and then this is like that Geiger counter that I get uh, on, on my phone. So I can see over the last 14 days, which days did I have some exposures, which day did I go over the threshold? I can go in and see what amount of infection I was exposed to for how long. Uh, so we always want to be very transparent that this is all we have. We don't know anything more. We don't know where you were. We don't know who you were with. All we know is the total infectiousness you got exposed to for how long. And we think that adds up to a certain amount of thresholds. Uh, and then if someone does test positive, they go into the app and they choose that I want to share anonymously with everyone that I just tested positive and I was symptomatic yesterday. Uh, and I want to do my part to the community and that's it. Um, and then, and then we do all the math and we notify the right people that based on this one thing and maybe other exposures you had, this is what we think you might want to do. So that way, it's a trust system. It's a paid forward system. It's completely anonymous, completely private, but everyone feels like I got benefit from it. I want to give back and I want to just keep uh, this, uh, uh, keep everyone uh, stay safe. Um, so this is a part I refer to, we invested a lot in operationalizing it. It's one thing to just have the app out and have people install it, right? But we want to make sure that public health is involved. We want to make sure when people share a diagnosis in the app that it's verified. Uh, we don't want people to just share it. Uh, you know, people, some might, even if one person shares it irresponsibly that I tested positive uh, and others get notifications that were not trustworthy, then it undermines the whole system. So public health issues codes to make sure that yes, you did actually test positive and you need that, that's the, that's the gating that you put in a code here to make sure that you are authorized to see this thing. And that's a key part of how this works. Um, and then on the public health side, they get a dashboard to kind of see overall what's going on uh, in, in, in the state and in the region they're focused on and how, how the app is kind of going comparing along with what else is going on in the state. Um, and you can dive into the regions to kind of see what's going on in specific counties and set different risk thresholds and different messaging for each one of them. So you've kind of invested a lot in that, where this is the final, basically the canvas that public health gets. Now everyone in the uh, state has installed the app. They, they can be stratified into different risk levels, and then we can decide what we tell them. Do we want them to do something different? Do we want them to register for uh, contact tracing when they're at medium risk, or do we only want to wait until they're high risk? Do we want to start telling them where they can get the vaccine? Because not everyone has that question. Uh, what phone number should they call? So all of this stuff can be set in real time. You don't need to update the app. It updates in real time. As soon as this is set here, uh, the app automatically starts to show the latest messaging and it can be customized by regions within the state. So every county can have their own canvas and choose different messaging and different testing regimens and different quarantine recommendations even, depending on what's going on there. So that's the other part you're invested in. Um, and so, um, just to call out that there's actually a lot that happens behind the scenes to make it work. There's been massive amount of work with Google, Apple, and a lot of engineers that all these servers are in the background and there's interoperability between them. All the states that are using Google, Apple's protocol can also exchange keys between them. If someone in Rhode Island goes to a neighboring state uh, and, and they're both using uh, similar apps, not even our app, we can still be able to notify each other about their exposures. So that's kind of the other part too. There's a national key server by APHL that helps coordinate all of this thing too, and we are kind of part of that too. Um, and the last piece here is that for this to really work, the last bottleneck is of course, as I said, you need to verify people that they have the right to say they tested positive. That's the, that's the input into the system. Like that's the first thing we need to know. Uh, so how do we scale that code delivery? Do, do they have to call uh, this, the public health uh, hotline uh, or can we uh, somehow deliver the code to them more quickly? Uh, so that's where we invested a lot uh, in integrating with labs themselves uh, and point of care systems too. So when I get tested and I get my test result, 
uh, I can just request a code right there and the lab can deliver the code to me. Like, hey, you just tested positive. So this is, for example, University of Arizona's patient portal. As a patient can go in, this is the first time I find out that I tested positive. I say I want to get a code uh, and the code is delivered to you right there. So right, right away, within a minute of finding out I'm positive, I can now type that code into the app and let everyone else know. Uh, and I didn't have to go into any manual process to do that. So that's one way. Uh, the other one is if I'm getting point of care, if it's a rapid test, uh, it's not even on a patient portal. I just found out in, in, a, in a doctor's office. Then the, we are also working with all the apps and things that doctors are already using uh, to also be able to generate codes right on the fly. So you can just contact your doctor like, hey, I tested positive, can I get a code? Because I want to share my diagnosis with everyone anonymously and you can request it that way as well. So that's basically kind of how all of these things kind of work together. Just also a small call out that we are creating a community around this, right? We've invested a lot in getting all the experts together. We had the forum for many months. We have the CDC and others involved. And every week, every other week, we talk a lot about what's going on and what the best practices are. We also launched uh, another kind of webinar this week uh, uh, that continues every week to kind of go, go into that a little bit more to make and learn more about it. So that's it from our side. Um, and of course, anyone, if you have any questions, you can also contact me after this and we're happy to also do a Q&A. Thank you, Samir. Mm -hmm. Right off the bat, before I forget, we actually have a quick question for you is, how do you plan to scale out EMR integration? That's from Joe Friedrichsen. Um, yeah, great. Um, so, um, so we think that, uh, so there's two parts to this. Uh, EMR integration, we don't need EMR integration for this to work off the bat, right? As long as someone can um, verify your test result uh, and give you a code, uh, there are many ways it can be done. So like uh, labs themselves know it and they can deliver the codes. Uh, point of care systems, uh, you know the result, you can deliver the codes. For the states, what we have seen is some states already have a system where reporting happens quickly enough that it's like, you know, within six hours, they know of positive test cases. Uh, and so they're able to centralize positive results quickly enough that they can deliver codes uh, from, from that. Uh, and similarly for public health, when they are within those uh, systems, the CRM systems and contact tracing systems, we have integrations where we can uh, actually just allow, like if you're a manual contact tracer and you're following up with an index case, uh, you can just on that script, have one more question that do you have the app installed? Would you like the code? And you can generate the code right there uh, inside the flow and, and give it to them. But since every state is different, not everyone is on similar enough systems, uh, it's different integration that we do, but that's what we do. We do different integrations sure. for uh, every public health authority that we work with. Sure, thank you. Wow, that went even way deeper than I thought it would. I was really especially glad to hear, see the interstate <laughs> key sharing as much as that might uh, excite some people's privacy uh, antennas. That's that's a good thing, especially here in Rhode Island where everybody crosses the state lines all the time, often for work. Um, all right, so we have about 15 minutes left for questions. I wanna be conscious of time, um, but I also wanna make sure that we get some questions for uh, both of you. Feel free to put your questions in the chat. I know people already have. Uh, the question I had for you, Dr. Les Goldberg, um, is this is really about using technology to change behavior. Both of you are, right? And as much as we say we bemoan how much phones have changed our behavior and kids don't talk to each other and nobody make eye contact and this and that, um, that New York Times article that Samir cited said adoption is a real problem. And I, and I hear you saying earlier on before the session began that people being in denial about their actual risk, even when faced with that dial that says, yep, you're, you're a very high risk, you're in that deep red zone, um, is a very real thing, right? So my question is, have you, what, how much have you thought about that user experience and that behavior change? And how, how necessary is it to really, I mean, really truly scare people or get, get a little bit more graphic? Your, your diagram of the foam lights and the aerosols was one of the best things I've ever seen in terms of seeing, visualizing transmission. So can you talk a little bit about how your team thinks about behavioral change as a result of your app? your app's results. Yeah, I mean, as, as someone that, you know, sees patients and, and tries to motivate them to make changes in terms of reducing their uh, tobacco use and reducing alcohol use, it's, um, it's a really important question. And I'll tell you that as much as we would like everyone to use this app, they already need to be in that stage of contemplation where they're open to changing their behaviors. And there's definitely going to be a segment of the population who 
feels that um, who's also empowered by many of our politicians that, um, that feels that they don't need to change their behavior. So, um, you know, we've heard a lot of stories about in what scenarios our, apps, our app has been used. And I think it has, um, some of the things we've heard is that family members have used this app when they have a more reluctant family member that's maybe planning like a, um, a large get together for a birthday party to show them why they're opting out of that and give them a really objective assessment of what the risk is of attending that activity. So um, hopefully, uh, hopefully this is putting some arguments uh, to rest about whether it's an actual high risk or low risk event. Um, so I think it's useful for that situation. We've also heard from coworkers that have been invited to showers and have said, um, you know, this is the reason I'm not going. You know, I would have, I would have otherwise been too shy to like decline the invitation, but um, now I can point to this, um, to this, you know, science evidence-based uh, calculator to to show what the risk is. So you do need to have some baseline level of motivation to use it, and then, of course, you need to get it out. There's a lot of um, uh, information and different information sources. And I think one of the reasons we've been successful is because my co-creator, Dr. Rani, has a very large social media presence and she's been able to get this out um, to, to local and national news um, and international news sources. So um, that, that's definitely been a challenge and we also had a, a lot of help getting the word out. I'm, that is great. That is like a super service to the nation that 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 publicity has gone so far and wide. I'm excited for you, but I'm also happy that it's out there. Samir, same question for you uh, in a different sort of uh, tack, the, the privacy concerns of people, you know, the, the difficulty you have in explaining that protocol, you know, your slide is great and, and you explained it as clearly as I think one could, and yet uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, right? And so people don't necessarily trust um well a lot of things but but that their app is telling them the right things that they're that they should download an app to begin with can you talk a little bit about the 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 thinking you've had around the the, the distribution and the adoption problem yeah absolutely i think for any such thing as you called out there, there are a few kind of friction points that can hurt adoption and uh people trusting and understanding it is one piece of it but the other thing that we have seen is overall um just awareness, uh, like even with the universities where we did it, where we saw that the investment was made in making people know that this is a thing versus where it wasn't, we saw like a huge difference in adoption. Uh, mm -hmm. So just knowing about it, just knowing that this thing exists, knowing that it's actually being used, uh, we think makes a huge impact. Uh, and so then it kind of ran into a little bit of a, a cash 22, right? Like this is brand new stuff, right? And it requires not just us to communicate to end users, it requires public health and everyone to get involved and get on board. But this is how we're gonna do things in our state. You can't even start a pilot until the state actually uh, approves it because Google Apple are guarding the API. They do not want just independent, uh, different uh, pilots running around inside the state. They want public health to be involved on day one. Uh, so then you need to show that you have adoption somewhere else. You need to show that it's working before public health can have the time and energy to invest in something like this. So there's a little bit of that. It's a few months in, now we have all these things coming together. Also what has happened just in the last month is Google, Apple now are investing a lot in directly helping marketing this thing too. They can mm. now send a push notification to everyone that, hey, if you are a resident of the state, your state is just letting you know right now that there's this thing you can use. And you just get this overnight adoption right to 30% to 50% of the state when that goes out. Uh, Cause you're like, oh, all right. You don't have to rely on just radio ads and marketing and other things, but that makes a big kind of shift happen. And then mm -hmm. the other part is when someone in someone you know gets a notification, uh, uh, then you want to get in and you want to get that after because you start mm -hmm. to suddenly see that it's working. So we think that yes, uh, there has been different levels of adoption. In some jurisdictions, we have seen very high adoption, and in some we haven't. And it comes down to less about people's perception about the technology itself but more about the effort done to actually just get it out. Interesting, interesting. Uh, Liz, I'm thinking a lot about schools and I'm thinking a lot about the people's perception of how safe a school classroom is. And I know in Providence, I've, I've literally seen it with my own eyes, the air um, filters, purifiers that are being distributed um, there are an important part of the strategy. But how do you, you know, if I were to model a typical school classroom in your app, I could get uh, low to medium or a medium to high risk 
environment um, depending upon the factors. So how do you, not only as your position as a physician, but also as a school board uh, member, uh, talk about the, the risk of classrooms in schools? Thanks, Doug. That's such an important issue now and, and has been part of the national conversation, I think, since the start of, of COVID-19. Our, our app actually does not help you calculate the risk of being in a classroom because that's cumulative, cumulative risk. So you're going to be spending you know, 20, 30 hours per week in a classroom and um, it's not one discrete activity. So I wouldn't use um, this app for that assessment, but the risk mitigation measures work in every setting. So um, what we're doing in classrooms here in Providence is really a layered approach where um, the older children, so those um, greater than 12 that we know are more likely to be vectors for disease, um, are in a hybrid model where um, there's less people in the building at any given time. And um, the other approach has been to um, open windows. So we know that um, ideally we would achieve four to six circulations of that air in one, any one um, hour and ways to do that are to open windows but also um, some some other uh, buildings may have HVAC uh, that's usually not the case for most US uh, classrooms um, you can use air purifiers and some the air purifiers that they've installed now in the Providence classrooms um, do achieve the four to six uh, air circulations per hour and you, you do need to know the dimensions of the classroom so that was challenging and I've actually offered some one-on-one -on -one, um, help to many of the teachers for um, to help them understand the air purifiers and and calculate their um, the square footage in their own classrooms and so this is a really challenging time there's not a lot of engineers and scientists that have focused on aerosol transmission and so mm. a lot of what we know now is um, is really coming from some, some just a handful of like elite scientists in the in the United States that have volunteered a lot of their time to help um, inform public health, and I'm really grateful for that. I was looking at your Facebook page and seeing the ongoing live conversation by teachers and parents about the air purifiers in the classrooms and things like that. You um you don't get rest, do you? You're, you're getting it from all sides. Uh, the interesting question that just came through the chat for either of you, and maybe I'll stay with you Liz for a moment, but then Samir will we'll hop to you is, do you see it, it important or do you see, do you know if the older generation is using your tools? Um, does it matter? I don't know if you get demographic breakdown, Liz, from your app, because it doesn't specifically ask age, but um, how do you think about risk for, and you're the perfect to ask for the, for the geriatric population versus the more middle-aged or younger? Sure. So um, I run clinical trials with older adults using the Apple Watch, and I will tell you that they're they're not digital natives. So mm. uh, when we talk about digital natives, we talk usually about people that are under the age of forty that grew up with cell phones and smartphones, and they, you know, at age two or three knew how to scroll um, a smartphone. That's not the case for many seventy or eighty year olds. Um, and so you know, talking about how how we can make sure that we improve their health and reduce their risks too is important. But I will say that when you show older adults, either you know grandchildren can do this or, or children can do this, when you show them how to use these technologies, they often are able to use it. And many of the older adults uh, that I see in, in the emergency department, even in their 80s, can use, use bank apps on their phone, um, text message, use Facebook. And so um, even though this app clearly is uh, easier to use and much more um, self-explanatory for someone in their you know, 20, 30s, 40, 50s. Um, I think that uh, we try to make it very user-friendly with larger icons and uh, more accessible to, to older folks. We also know that um, in the most recent couple of months, it's really been the, the adolescents and the 20 year olds that um, when their case counts increase, we see hospitals, hospitalizations for older adults in that same community increase uh, 10 days to two weeks afterwards. So we know that there are um, in many areas in the country now that it's that age group that we really need to target to keep older folks safe. So what I hear you saying is to save lives, we need to give our parents and grandparents iPads for the holidays? Not quite what I'm saying. Okay. I, I um, like Apple Samir, <laughs> Samir, same question for you, but a slightly different thrust. You know, um, I think it's accepted wisdom and maybe not true that, that you know, smartphones trend skew younger. Um, but what would you say to the, the, the need for the older generation to, to uh, you know, have your app installed and have it tracking them? 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. And we are looking at that since day one, right? Because this requires a smartphone. So even just looking at what's the distribution of smartphones, that, that also decides what the adoption trends might be. Uh, because we are the default app for the state, uh, 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 and that's how it has to work for everyone uh, in the state, we have invested a lot in making design super easy. And, and the use case really is you set and forget. You install it, you enable it, you turn it on, just one thing. And we invest a lot in just that one event is like, getting someone to just opt in. And then they never have to even open the app again. Uh, the app doesn't have to be running. It runs at the OS level. So your phone is keeping track of things for you. And you only get alerted if you had an exposure event. So that's when it just notifies you. And that's why you invested in the simple thing. Am I, do I need to do something or not? Is it green or is it red? And that's it. And then it's just like, all right, if it's red, here are the three things you need to do. Click here to call this number and, current, and directly now, you have someone you are talking to about what I should do next. So those are some of the things we have done. As you called out, we don't have direct demographic information on usage either, which is completely anonymous, but we tested the app a lot with, uh, with all age groups, especially with uh, higher age groups as well. And we saw there was a division on some are digital natives and then some are not. And so that's kind of the other kind of trend there too, where some will actively actually engage with it and then some won't. Uh, and that tends to be again, like a break even within the demographic. And as I was saying earlier, uh, if some people in the community use it, it helps everyone else. So you don't actually need everyone to be using it to still yeah. benefit from it. I thought that would be the core of your answer too. That's really true. It's like, <laughs> it's like herd immunity. You only need to get to a certain threshold and then it's effective. Um, so really quick, in the couple minutes we have left, I wanna ask one important question, which is thinking ahead beyond the pandemic, which we're not really doing yet, but we could. Um, these tools seem to have legs beyond that do you have you given thought to that about how your tools might be used post covid sars cov 2 and and into other epidemiological circumstances uh, do you do you see that being a, a viable use case samir we'll stay with you and then we'll go to liz uh, very quickly okay yeah so i'll make it really quick yes so we start to see right away right these are some huge shifts like after 9 11 the world shifted and the shift state uh, uh, and similarly now in this year, some things have shifted. We have realized there's opportunities uh, and we have been able to see a concentration of things come together to think about, all right, what do we do next time? How do we make sure we are prepared better? So all the customers you're working with, all the PhDs you're working with, they're like, we're investing in this for the long term. We wanna think about how do we now leverage this thing that we're investing in getting half the people in the state to actually install this thing. We wanna make sure we keep using it over a longer time. So communication platform, right there, we invest a lot in that. That's an important need. Uh, I don't know right now. I'm in Sacramento. I actually don't know where I should go to find out what's relevant to me for my public health. But if I had the app, then I would, because I know how I can actually get the direct information coming in. Uh, and then similarly, other disease vectors uh, and, and, uh, and kind of things that we also want to think about. We're investing in some of those things right now. Uh, so we think this will keep evolving over a long term. I, I agree. Uh, Liz, what are your thoughts for the future of your tool? Just really briefly, so we know that COVID-19 is the third leading cause of death right now in, in the United States, but after COVID-19 um, is under better control, we're still going to have other respiratory illnesses. And for instance, in the school-aged children, respiratory illnesses are one of the leading um, causes of asthma exacerbation, which we know is the top reason why kids don't attend school and have chronic absenteeism. And so using apps such as our own to help uh, school systems and individuals and families understand how they can reduce respiratory um, illnesses, I think will be important to getting our um, kids into school and consistently um, being in, area, in, in schools with good ventilation and um, air purification and um, those in environments that are conducive to health. Excellent. Well, thank you both very much for being here. We're bang on two o'clock. Well done. You, we, we trained you well. Um, if you anybody here wants to know more about either of these tools, you can go to mycovidrisk.app or you can follow Liz at, at Liz Goldberg MD on Twitter and the Brown Center for Digital Health is, let me get this right, digitalhealth.med.brown.edu. Um, and Samir, you can find in his blog, is it, I'm sorry, samirhalai.com, is it? Yeah, um, that's right. And also uh, the COVID Watch uh, at covidwatch.org is the, the location of their app. Um, thank you both very much for being here. Thank you both very much for all the hard work you've done in the past several months. I hope the next several months continue to be successful for you and that we continue to see uh, dividends from your extraordinary tools. I really appreciate your taking the time to be with us today. Thanks so much for having us.
Thank you all Thank you who are much. here. Um, I really appreciate it. We're going to put this up on our site as a video. Um, we may, even if we have a moment, to condense it down to some of the more salient points, make it slightly less than an hour, and, uh, and put it out for everyone else who wasn't able to make it today. So um, I hope you tell your friends and uh, come to uh, ocean.org, O-S-H-E-A-N, and, uh, and come see the, the recap. And, uh, and everybody stay safe and stay well. Thank you very much. Thank you.